Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Michael Spicer, your moderator for this evening. Welcome to the Western Cape Branch of SIA's webinar on the NATO withdrawal and the future of Afghanistan. We are fortunate this afternoon to have two panelists who know the country intimately, know the history of it really well, and I think therefore will make for a lively and interesting session. First up, Dr. Greg Mills, well known to all who have links with SIA, currently head of the Joburg-based foundation, the Brentis Foundation, established in 2005 by the Oppenheimers to strengthen African economic performance. Uh, multiple author, wears many hats, but more importantly for this evening's session, has spent several stints of time in Afghanistan, most recently this year, I think he has been three times uh, at the invitation of uh, the president. And so he is sort of hot off the press, so to speak. So Greg, I'm gonna ask you to begin. I'll introduce John uh, when you've finished and then we'll take questions and answers thereafter. Over to you, Greg. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. I currently wear one fewer hat than you, however. Uh, um, uh, I'm pleased to see that uh, standards at SIA have slipped since I was there. Um, now, it's a really a great pleasure to be here. Michael is a, lo a longtime friend uh, and something of a personal mentor. Uh, and it's always a privilege and a pleasure to, to speak at SIA events. It's a particular privilege because Afghanistan is one of those countries that's, that really gets under your skin. And my engagement with the country began in 2006 uh, when then Lieutenant General David Richards, now Lord Richards of Hurst Monceau, uh, asked me to set up and run the PRISM Strategic Advisory Group in the headquarters, uh, in ISAF headquarters in Kabul, which I did during 2006. Uh, and it was a very uh, difficult experience. Uh, it was a very undermanned force. Uh, it was slightly difficult being a South African civilian in a headquarters dominated uh, by NATO uh, member troops. Um, and it was difficult being a civilian, of course, in a military dominated headquarters. Uh, and it was much against my better instinct that I accepted an invitation to go back in 2010 uh, to be an advisor in the PRISM group, which had been reconstituted, taking on board much of the advice that I'd left behind in terms of how to get a civilian group to operate better in a military organization. Uh, and I was based then in Kandahar, which I did twice in 2010, uh, under the generalship of then Major General Nick Carter, now General Sir Nick Carter, Chief of Defense Staff of the UK. Uh, and then I went back in 2012 uh, as uh, General Carter's uh, advisor when he was uh, uh, the deputy commander of ISAF, again, based in Kabul. So I hadn't been there for nearly 10 years, and I've just finished writing a book on aid, uh, which is due to be published, called Expensive Poverty. So you can get the drift of what it's about. And it largely encapsulates my experiences over the last 15 years of working at Brentest. And of course, given that Afghanistan has been so central in what I've done, um, uh, there was almost inevitably a chapter on Afghanistan uh, and the difficulty of bringing stability from outside. And perhaps it's the most extreme representation of those difficulties, given the amount of money that has been expended, given the amount of time and energy and effort that's been uh, um, spent on Afghanistan, more than two million um, People have uh, served through Afghanistan uh, over the last 20 years. Um, nearly uh, 8,000 international lives lost both military and civilian contractors. Uh, um, and of course, this pales against the cost to Afghans of some nearly 200,000 lives. But perhaps the most staggering statistic of, of all is the more than $2 trillion which have been expended in Afghanistan uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, and we still don't see peace. In fact, far from it, we don't. We, we see a, a surge in the war, which I'm sure uh, you are all aware of, which I'll address in a second. So it's against this background that I went back in February, uh, a trip largely uh, 
facilitated by General Carter, uh, who I keep in contact with. Uh, and I was there at the invitation of President Ghani. And he asked me to go back uh, this June and July. I came back three weeks ago uh, to conceptualize how a peace process could work in the region and to try and help to bring about a new narrative uh, of peacemaking uh, in Central Asia. And some of you may have seen the documentary that I produced with um, President Delushigan Nabasanjo, my chairman, uh, who came out uh, for a brief part of my trip uh, and we filmed this documentary together. It's called The Asian Roundabout. Uh, and I would strongly urge you to take a look at it, not because I made it uh, or that I'm presenting in it. It just simply encapsulates in 30 minutes all of the challenges that we face, all of the mistakes that have been made, uh, and some of the prospects for peace as we see them uh, in that country. And it's, of course, a visually very striking country uh, as well. Uh, um, so it carries some of that with it. It has, interestingly enough, just to show the level of, of contemporary interest and import of Afghanistan, in the last six days, it's been viewed by more than a million and a half people uh, around the world just on, on social media alone. And now it's starting to be picked up by television channels. So the world's attention is once more, 20 years, nearly after 9-11, focused on Afghanistan. Uh, it's, of course, in a very precarious position. Um, uh, the, the Taliban has taken over roughly half, slightly over half, of, of the various districts around the country, numbering uh, around 400 uh, districts in total. It's taken more than 200 of those. And now it's pressing very hard on these pro three provincial capitals of uh, Lashkagar in Helmand province, of Kandahar City in, in the province of the same name, and then of Arat in the west or northwest, uh, which is the city closest uh, to, uh, to Iran. Uh, and the strategy, of course, of the Taliban uh, is really to, to start taking, rolling up these areas. Herat's a bit of an outlier because it's an Hazara-dominated area. Uh, but, of course, Kandahar and Helmand very much Pashtu areas, the heartland, homeland of the Taliban, as it were, particularly around Kandahar, uh, where it was formed back in the early 90s. Um, it's, it's, it's by no means a struggle that is over, however. Um, one of the big takeaways that one should realize out of Afghanistan, and it looks pretty desperate uh, if you follow the news, but you tend to get that impression from the topical focus on, on uh, defeat, uh, the topical focus on on these rural areas, on the numbers of these rural districts being rolled up by the Taliban. Uh, and the thing, the situation is never as bad uh, uh, on the ground as it seems to be uh, when portrayed by the media. And why do I say that? Well, one of the big problems that Afghanistan has faced, the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, is that it was bequeathed over 200 military bases by the United States, spread very thinly over the entire country, um, where its real fighting element is in a special forces component of around 40,000 people. It has 10 times that number of troops on paper, but the real core element is about 40,000 people plus an air force. And it's had to spread these over these 200 areas, often you know, poorly defended, poorly resourced, and, and all of the 200 supplied by helicopter in this particular instance. Um, and they have enough helicopters to supply 80 of these districts. So it's, it's no rocket scientist uh, who could come to the deduction that the best thing you can do is to consolidate your forces, uh, get out of trying to defend these rural areas and suffer massive attrition in the process uh, and, uh, and, and consolidate in and around the population centers, which, of course, are these provincial capitals where the Taliban is now uh, fighting uh, for control, as I've already mentioned. So it's not over yet, uh, is the first point I would make. And let me just briefly in the remaining time that I have speak about three things which I think are pertinent to the conversation today. And the first is really about lessons, what lessons we can draw from Afghanistan when viewed over this 20 year period. I want to talk a little bit about the differences with Vietnam because there's a sort of feeling of a high speed Saigon underway at the moment. For those of you who remember the 1975 moment uh, 
uh, of history when uh, 30th of April, uh, the North Vietnamese took over uh, uh, Saigon and you have all these images of helicopters leaving and the like. Uh, it, it, it's different in many respects to Vietnam and I'll come back to that. And then thirdly, I'm gonna talk very briefly about what now. So the first thing I would say is uh, in terms of the, West, of the Western strategy towards Afghanistan, what this teaches us is very simply um, that, uh, let me highlight a couple of lessons for you. The first lesson I would say is that, that the West's best was simply not good enough. Um, the lives of three and a half thousand international troops, plus all the Afghans who've died, have not been sufficient to turn the tide against the Taliban. Uh, and, and I think the reason for that uh, is that this is a mission that uh, in part got uh, uh, distracted by what went on in Iraq, um, but in part because the West political leadership did not resource the mission properly from the very beginning and lacked the strategy and the patience necessary to execute a longer war. And you'll remember that the war at the beginning was all about regime change, uh, and only later became about nation building and supporting that. Uh, um, and so from the, from the very beginning, uh, the West essentially made up the plan that as they went along. And this process of iteration was very much subject to changes in personalities, whether these be particular commanders or politicians or ambassadors. There was little clear cut strategy from the outset and it really focused at the beginning much more on the operational art of the military, um, which, as I say, morphed from regime change into nation building, uh, sort of constantly reverse engineered by facts on the ground, uh, uh, rather than as an overarching political strategy. The big failure was that from the very outset, the West lacked a political and diplomatic strategy to manage the situation in Afghanistan. Um, you know, if you look back now, you would say that the big missed opportunity was what happened at Bonn in 2002, when they really should have made peace with the Taliban, and they didn't. Uh, and as you know, any of those who've read Clausewitz uh, will realize that, you know, war is politics by other means, but war is also the illustration of the failure of politics. And so you need a political solution to be able to make this right. Uh, and if the last 20 years teaches us anything, it's about the failure of politicians to remain engaged over a long period of time and to put the sort of resources behind making regional peace. And I'll return to that in a second. I think the third big lesson is that the solutions were driven by, by both by personalities, but also by a misguided search for institutional relevance, in particularly on the part of NATO, searching for a relevancy post uh, a Cold War. Um, and the, the metrics of the mission chosen often suited uh, the, those politics of NATO. I think the third big lesson is this lesson of, or the fourth big lesson is the lesson of the region, which is that geography ultimately trumped and swallowed the goodwill that was present post immediately 9-11. Not only did the Taliban prove to be a particularly resourceful and determined and formidable and military, very militarily, very effective foe who've learned lots of lessons which they have put into effect, um, but they also re continually received and continue to receive greater volumes of assistance from outside, particularly from Pakistan, but also from a range of other regional actors who all had particular uh, um, missions to, to, to try and fulfill. Uh, and overall, of course, they're related to the fact that the United States was there uh, and, and, and they centered on this, this, this um, relationship between Afghanistan and, uh, and Pakistan. Uh, and you see this particularly in the current strategic sophistication of the, of, the, of the contemporary Taliban offensive, which is, is all about trying to pressurize Kabul by closing off access to its northern trading inland ports uh, into the stands and forcing dependence on its southern routes into Pakistan, um, which I think in itself perfectly illustrates the sort of pattern and extent of regional influences. 
And I think the, the final, fifth and final big failure is, is really the failure of development assistance. Uh, I saw some of, I mean, I'm pretty hardened to the, the way in which development assistance is spent badly, but I saw some of the most egregious expenditure on development assistance in Afghanistan simply imaginable, where really it was all about the metrics of expenditure rather than the metrics of, of delivery, effect, and success. Uh, and, and it showed more than anything that aid programs, especially in these circumstances where you're trying to create stability, uh, uh, are largely antithetical to economic development because in part because they're mostly led by people who do not understand or who do not like business. Uh, and so more than 125 billion US dollars in soft donor money towards development projects uh, that flowed into Afghanistan was not wasted entirely, but a lot of it was stolen precisely because the West knew that it would be stolen by the people that they were trying to keep inside the tent uh, um, rather than outside. Uh, and that level of corruption has ultimately come back to haunt them enormously. I say secondly, that this is different to Vietnam because um, uh, it's not over, firstly. Uh, it's not a nationalistic struggle. Uh, of course, the Taliban is dominated by Pashtu who, who comprise roughly 40% of, of, of Afghanistan's population. Uh, but they're not trying to reunite the country as the North Vietnamese were. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is similar in terms of the pace of perhaps their advance. Uh, it is similar in terms of the, pay, of the manner in which the United States has made peace, which is essentially akin to that uh, of, of, of what it did with the South Vietnamese, which is make peace with your enemy, in that case Hanoi, uh, and leave out your ally and not essentially resupply them uh, as you promised, uh, which was of course the case of Nixon and a Democrat controlled Congress at the time. But the United States has done pretty much the same here with the Taliban. It made a separate peace uh, in, in February this year. It got out, wants to get out by the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And essentially in, in so doing, it's left its ally high and dry. Um, you could argue that its ally should have done more uh, it could argue that its allies should have realized this day was going to come. But, you know, I think in these circumstances, you all know that, you know, there's a sad axiom in, in, in stabilizing failed states that the period of recovery is at least as long as the period of decline. Uh, they knew that strategic patience was their greatest ally, uh, but they were unwilling for the American domestic political reasons uh, to accept that, despite the fact there'd been no combat death since 2018 uh, by American forces uh, in Afghanistan. So essentially they, they got out at all costs and now are running for the exit and in so doing fueling a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, of defeat uh, and a narrative of defeat. And that's really my third point here. What can be done? Well, as of today, uh, um, uh, and I was only speaking uh, half an hour before this meeting uh, with a senior uh, military commander uh, um, who who's, uh, uh, spends a lot of time there. Uh, you know, the Afghans are actually holding the line um, in Lashkagar. They have seemingly kicked the vast majority of Taliban out of Herat. So I think the first point is it's not over. Of course, they've had to use their special forces again to do so. They're exhausting their resources. They're exhausting their air capability, which, as I said already, is, is, um, is it operating at maximum stretch. And the Taliban seemingly have an infinite reservoir of troops, or maybe they don't. Uh, uh, maybe they, too, are going to be tired out by, this, uh, by the extent of, the, of their troop losses. Uh, um, and I think the hope that everybody has at this juncture is essentially that the government uh, can fight the Taliban to a standstill and in so doing enable the conditions for peace uh, to occur. Uh, um, you know, I think conflict resolution generally teaches us, and I'm sure that John will talk about this, conflict resolution teaches us that you need three conditions to make peace. You need the parties who are fighting to believe that there's more to be gained from ending fighting than continuing with it. And certainly 
the Taliban don't believe that as of yet. And so some more fighting will have to happen. And if the, the government can fight them to a standstill in these urban areas, then you have a greater chance of peace. Secondly, you need all the external parties pushing the conflicting parties to the negotiating table. Uh, it's no good if just the United States is pushing the government to the negotiating table, uh, or, or even some of the region pushing the government to the negotiating table. Everybody has to be pushing the two major uh, uh, elements, in this case, the Taliban and the government to the negotiating table. And, and, and this demands a huge amount of diplomatic effort and energy, particularly with Pakistan and particularly with Iran. And finally, you need to have, of course, as we know only too well in South Africa, you need to have leadership who can seize the moment and you need method and you need timing. So I'll end just by saying there is a narrative of peace possible. It will demand a continued level of engagement and support with Afghanistan, particularly by the international community. It will demand the Afghans themselves consolidating their forces and keeping on fighting so that they can uh, talk a peace uh, uh, with the Taliban. And it demands these regional linkages. And I think if the one big failure, to circle back to where I started, the one big failure, I would say, and big lesson for me uh, of of Afghanistan is how diplomacy was effectively trumped by, by the military, the art of the operational, the, the, the operational art of the military, should I say, uh, back in 2001, and great store was placed in a military solution. And as we know, and as I've already said, these things are ended by better politics and astute diplomacy, not by military means. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Greg. Bang on time. Uh, just a reminder, we're not going to take live questions, so please do post your questions on the Q&A board, and they will be then put to the two panellists at the completion of their opening interventions. We now turn to John Mattison, who, as we all know, is a noted journalist, author, and broadcaster, published two major works on South Africa recently, but more relevant for our discussion tonight, has also spent a long time, some 19 months in Afghanistan, working successively for the UN as chairperson of the Electoral Media Commission for the 2005 Parliamentary and Provincial Council elections. In 2009, as international advisor to the Electoral Media Commission, uh, which he established, and in 2010 as acting project manager of the UN's election project. So, John, over to you for your intervention. Um, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Greg. Um, uh, I want to start by making two introductory points. First, this is a, an important conversation for me because, like uh, Greg, I, 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 I see South Africa facing potential war in northern North Mozambique, and I fear the lack of sufficient serious public assessment in South Africa, as, as just as in the US there was insufficient serious public assessment prior to going into Afghanistan. Um, in my career experience, bad wars are too easy to start. And the second is, um, uh, I, I, Greg, I, I found myself uh, having read Greg's last few pieces and listening today, I, I pretty much agree with him on, 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 on everything. Um, uh, I'll highlight some differences, maybe semantic, but, but to, to illustrate some points that I think are important. Um, but I'm, I'm probably not quite as kind as, as Greg in, the, in, in, the, in, the al in al allocating blame. Uh, I think um, it's important not to uh, be, be um, biased by US partisan loyalties. Um, uh, those of you who are familiar with my News 24 column probably know that I think Joe Biden's work in other parts of the world are a massive and even exciting step forward in many areas. But when you talk about, about Afghanistan, it's got to be on its own merits. And on its own merits, I think he's made a, a, a very bad uh, decision. Um, I, I think we're risking a very severe humanitarian uh, crisis. Uh, I think the Taliban could get very strong. I also think I'm going to talk a little bit more about the warlords uh, 
who are uh, who are, who could well be a, again a factor. Um, uh, I, I just for your interest, I, I once was in a conversation in London with Tony Wedgwood Ben, and who, who said, "Oh, Amer um, America, well, the West must just get out of Afghanistan." And it was easy to see why. Um, but I I found myself uh, at the sharp end of his of, of his tongue because I disagreed. Um, I think the, the, the West made terrible mistakes going into Afghanistan, which I'm going to talk about, but we are going to have to blame Biden for the way he's getting out. Um, I think that to understand why he took these decisions, I think he was driven by two imperatives. The first is, uh, you know, balancing the balancing act in domestic US politics. The American people are tired of it. They got in too enthusiastically and they're now too hot for uh, to stay and want to get out. <clears throat> also, he's always had a concern about veterans and his son was a veteran. And so I think the idea of getting out is a very, very good domestic, he sees as a, as a, a domestic imperative. And the second reason I think he was anxious to get out is, because, is nat a national security issue, which is the need for the US to shift to its bigger foreign policy concerns. As you may recall, Obama tried to pivot to Asia uh, uh, and his tra uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Pact was really about trying to contain China, although it's uh, not understood in that way by Trump and others. Um, uh, but but he was constantly drawn back to to these issues of the past and issues which the U.S. no longer sees as pivotal. So I understand what's motivated Biden, but I think that it may well be a disaster for Afghanistan. Now, to what kind of mess we in? Um, uh, Greg says in, in one of his articles correctly that uh, the West should have negotiated with the Taliban when it was weak rather than now when it is strong. And I completely agree, but I want to tell you what that means in practice. Um, and, and, and also to argue the one area which I, I think is a semantic difference, maybe because uh, Greg refers to the West giving its best but wasn't good enough. But reading you in context, Greg, I think you're not really saying the West gave it its best because it made such uh, severe mistakes. And I want to start with the first one, which was the Bonn Peace Conference. Um, the Bonn Peace Conference was a peace conference to which the combatants were not, in, were not present. This should have been a five alarm fire. Imagine in South Africa in the 1990s, if George Herbert Walker Bush and maybe Budalesi at best decided to settle the future of South Africa. Actually, what they did was much worse. The Taliban weren't invited. The warlords fighting the war didn't come because they were still fighting. This was December, the beginning of December. Um, and the, um, the, the people who were present at the peace conference chose a leader. And then, uh, what was his name? James Dobson, I think the American representative said, I think you meant to say Hamid Karzai. And the Afghans all said, we better talk about this. They thought they were certain that their, their rooms in, in the Bond Hotel were, were bugged. So they met in the corridors and, and tugged on their beards and said, I guess we meant Hamid Karzai. Now, this is not to say Karzai was a bad choice, but to me, I mean, as a South African, it's fundamentally uh, uh, disastrous. If you have a peace conference and you don't invite the peace, the 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 combatants, and you and you decide on a, a leader uh, uh, against the wishes of the of the conference itself. Now again, Karzai comes in for a lot of flack, and I'm not one of those who join it. I think he was basically a good choice, but uh, the errors that were made um, made life impossible. And the most uh, significant thing uh, example of this was that. You know, Karzai was made um, president, chosen as the acting president at Bonn, uh, and he was notified by Lee's Doucette as he was recovering from the dropping of the U.S. bomb, a 2,000 pound U.S. bomb on his people. It was an error, and uh, um, uh, he re he realized he had to get to Kandahar immediately to prevent his warlord opponent, Gul Aga Shazai. From, from taking over Kandahar, which as Greg has explained, was, uh, Kandahar is critical. He got there, when he got to Kandahar, who, was, who had been put in charge as governor of Kandahar? Shazai. Who put him there? 
another group of American CIA. Now, again, I don't, this was not a conspiracy. It was a cock-up, but it's a very severe cock-up. So, so uh, uh, Karzai became president knowing instantly that the most important, and everybody knows that the president of Afghanistan is very, very weak. People often call him the mayor of Kabul, um, is a very weak position. And to have Shazai, who he really didn't trust or, 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 um, or admire, as, as a governor of Kandahar, Kandahar fundamentally undermined him. Secondly, let's go to the war aid. The New Yorker just published a piece this week which says that the, the Afghan war began as an act of vengeance against the plans of 7, September 11 and the Taliban protectors. It evolved into something more abstract and impossibly ambitious, a sort of wholesale rebirth of Afghanistan it was a project few U.S. leaders knew how to complete, but nobody had the strength to stop. Um, uh, now, uh, um, what do we say about that? Well, this is basically correct. The first aim was to get Al Qaeda because Al Qaeda had launched uh, the attack on 9/11 from Afghanistan. Uh, but to say that this was a success because Bin Laden was killed in a body about ten full years later is kind. Extremely kind. Think about it. Osama bin Laden was a Torah borrower for most of the month of December. U.S. troops knew he was there. In fact, Peter Bergen has just come out with his new book on bin Laden this week, and he says there were more journalists at Torah Bora than there were U.S. troops. This was not the best the West could do. This was Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, who came into office with the determination to, to change the, the, the nature of, of, of uh, US military uh, uh, tactics and strategy to create light footprint wars, uh, high tech smart wars, faced with a completely different uh, war in Afghanistan and determined not to change his tactics. So, so I have a, an Afghan American friend who said to me, you know, when, they, when, the Americ when, the, when the Americans got there and said, which way did Bin Laden go? And, and one of the, the local um, Afghans said he went that way. He said that guy was bribed to 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 tell to to take Bin the other way and tell and, and tell and, and send the, the West in the wrong direction. So basically, there were a few American troops there. The troops were very anxious to go after him. They had orders not to, for reasons we don't have to, time to go into, and it was left to their local Afghan partners, and they didn't get him. So the first priority, which was clearly Al Qaeda, not the Taliban. Taliban was running Afghanistan um, uh, uh, what was, was really a, a, a massive disaster. Um, so then, uh, um, now, now, now what, what else was involved in, in their the war aim? So the first war aim was to get Al-Qaeda. They sort of got it, uh, um, uh, if you add the next 10 years that it took to, to catch him and have a bin Laden and a body, but, but it was disabled very quickly. Of course, it's very easy for America to inflict re regime change. In most countries in the world, their military is so tech they have so many generations, techno technological generations, in advance of, of, of most of their uh, 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 potential opponents that, that that's not a big issue. The question is, wh what, what, was, what did they plan to do once they did the regime change? Now, the various different arguments about how long that took and what they did about it. But let me just tell you very briefly, I interviewed um, Reg Austin, who some of you will know from Zimbabwe, a law professor. Reg Austin was the UN's head of elections uh, immediately after the war. He told me he couldn't get a budget for elections for quite a long time through 2002. Uh, there was no focus on it. Um, the result was uh, there was no voter registration. And the result of that was uh, through their, for various for very for that and other reasons, they adopted the um, election system, which election experts will tell you is the worst system in the world. It's called single single non transferable. But I don't have time to go into the details, except to tell you, you could have a beautifully run, fraud free election and produce a totally undemocratic result. Um, uh, um, so, so and, and by the way, I mean, I, I came in in 05 for the parliamentary elections. We did some work that I was very proud of, but um, um, 
When I came back in, in 2009, the members of parliament we had got elected, by the way, we got 25% women into parla the parliament and the provincial councils, uh, many of them younger, um, educated, etc. It was really quite a breakthrough, exciting period. At first, it felt a lot like 1994 in South Africa. But when I came back in, in 2009 and talked to the MPs we'd helped get elected, they said that uh, they, they were completely disillusioned because the parliament was ignored, because uh, and people like Rumsfeld and many others uh, would, would talk to the warlords, uh, but ignored the MPs. Uh, uh, I mean, we could go m much further into that, but that get, gets me um, in straight into the next point, which is about the warlords. The warlords were critical to US strategy. Um, and and, and, and uh, the warlords were widely hated. But most Afghan families know somebody who was killed by a warlord and they know which warlord. So this was an extremely um, toxic thing. But because if I have a book on my shelf here called First In, by the CIA about how they went in, they led, led the, the invasion of Afghanistan and how they did it using the warlords, because the warlords were the people they knew from the, uh, the anti-communist war of the previous decade. Um, uh, so, so they went in uh, uh, and used the warlords. Uh, and later, I often, I mean, even under Obama, I remember when I was in, Af in Afghanistan, the, the Obama administration leaked an attack on on Dostum, one of the warlords, for, the, for, for what he had done, which is suffocate hundreds of prisons, prisoners in burning hot containers years before. But that was known well before it had been publicized. And, and the US collaborated with him after that. And then later, the, the, the US was very critical of Karzai for working with the warlords. But the reason Karzai uh, finds that so frustrating is because they had given him no choice. The next thing I want to say is about drugs, which we haven't discussed. And this is because uh, um, uh, the first note, when I was researching Afghanistan, the first example I found of the West expanding its war aims from simply getting rid of Al Qaeda to uh, doing other things was from Tony Blair, of all people, who said, we're going into Afghanistan to stop the opium from getting to our kids in Birmingham. Uh, we're getting them in Afghanistan. Well, uh, you need to know something about that. Uh, unfortunately, I discovered that months before 9-11, the Bush administration rewarded the Taliban for containing opium production. In fact, let me just give you quick figures. In 2001, um, opium production and therefore heroin more or less stopped. There was a stockpile of about 185 tons. Um, in the first year after the, uh, the, the Taliban fell, the uh, um, opium production was 2,000 tons. The second year, 4,000, then 6,000, then 8,000. Now, again, this is not a conspiracy. The West didn't have a secret plot to, to, to build opium. Uh, they tried to stop it, but they were never able to grapple with with the scale of the problem and, and were often forced to abandon their, their desires to do so. So the Taliban, for their own reasons, and in a very brutal way, had stopped opium production, and maybe they would started it again another day for another reason, but the fact is it stopped under them and under, under uh, the, the post-war uh, regime, uh, opium production went up so much that it was a major part of the, American, the uh, Afghan economy. So much sub so that in the suburb where I, I lived in Kabul, in the UN guest house, the, the, the architecture is known as narcotecture, the architecture of the narco trade. The next thing I want to say before we start to run out of time is to talk a bit about the region. As, as, as I'm sure Gregor and others will tell you, that um, classic theory, if you're gonna fight a war against uh, local people, You've got to make sure there's no safe haven that they can flee to. Well, they had Pakistan from the beginning. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, stop an insurgency, uh, you've got to take account of that. Now, what happened? How did they go into this war? Uh, I think it was General Richard Armitage, who was the Deputy Secretary of State to Colin Powell, was sent after 9-11 to see the uh, President of Pakistan and telling him, tell him 
you're going to be on board our new war on, te on terror. Otherwise, we're going to bomb Afghanistan back into the Stone Age. Well, guess what, what the president of Pakistan did? Said He said, oh, I'm with you. No, don't worry, I'm on your side. But in fact, he never was. Uh, during this time, the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Bush administration period gave, I think, about 13 billion in aid and, and military to support to Pakistan. And throughout that period, Pakistan was, was playing a double game. And then it, again, we can't get into which parts and why, but the fact is that, that the uh, ISI, the intelligence service, and other parts of the <coughs> Pakistani military uh, was playing a double game. They were fighting the Taliban in some respects and supporting the Taliban in other respects. John, and then, two minutes. Okay, good. I, I'll, I'll, I'll close pretty quickly. I'll just add in next to Iran. Iran, as, as maybe you don't, many people may not remember, was an ally of the West in the war on terror. For, for its selfish interests, of course. The two Bush wars were very good for Iran. Uh, on the, to the west, they got rid of their enemy, Saddam Hussein. And to the east, in Afghanistan, they got rid of their enemy, the Sunni enemy, the Taliban. Uh, and in fact, the, the war co caused a rise in oil prices. So what was not to like if you were Iran? But then uh, Bush made his speech about the axis of evil an axis that consisted of a communist family dynasty in an axis with a secular Sunni Saddam regime and a theocratic Shiite Iran. That axis of evil speech stay, uh, phrase was written by a speechwriter, not a foreign policy expert, but it was allowed to appear. And the Iranians were naturally shocked. They couldn't understand how they'd been an ally as uh, only months before when this was allowed to happen. In the next election, and I think this is, I, I am finishing pretty fast, uh, the uh, Iranian election with uh, um, Bush declaring them an enemy, a hardliner, Ahmadinejad, was elected. Under Obama, when, when he uh, put out an olive branch, they elected a moderate. So, so the Iranian component of this has been, has been very badly mismanaged. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to come to an end there because we're out of time and I'm going to look forward to questions. But I will just end by saying that um, the warlords are part of the mobilizing now. Um, I, certainly in Herat, for instance, with Ishmael Khan, he's being encouraged to, to, to re reactivate his militias. Uh, I don't think the, the Afghans feel they have much of a choice. Uh, I, I don't know how any of this is going to end. Uh, obviously, I hope... Uh, that uh, the Afghans and the, the West have some plans to, um, to provide support of the kind that Greg has spoken about and written about, but uh, given past uh, experience, I'm very worried. I'll, Thanks I'll very stop. much indeed, John. Um, right, we've got a load of questions um, and perhaps we can go straight into picking up from some of your concluding comments, John, uh, because there are several questions relating to who are the backers of the Taliban? Uh, what is the role of Pakistan? What, is, what are their aims and objectives? Um, and then a second rather important question, which we pro probably spend quite a bit of time on, Please assess the changes of the international situation around Afghanistan. What does this changing situation mean for Russia and China and for the Central Afri Asian states? What could, should, or would any of them do in the present situation? Are any changes in strategic alliances possible? So that's a pretty big question. Uh, so would both of you care to, to uh, comment on those two uh, questions first? Should I take a stab at some of it and, and leave the whole? Well, why, don't, why, why, don't, why don't we ask uh, Greg to kick off and then uh, you can pick up um, uh, okay. thereafter, John. Greg? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for the questions, which I've also had a, a peek at on the Q&A. They, as ever, excellent. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's that fantastic book uh, written by... Muhammad Hanif called uh, A Case of Exploding Mangoes. Uh, and if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend. Uh, um, 
that you do. And essentially, it's about the assassination of Muhammad uh, um, Zia ul Haq. Um, uh, and uh, in 1988, and a bomb was placed, apparently, uh, in a case of mangoes, uh, and he was killed. And essentially what the, the novel uh, says is that everybody had uh, a reason for trying to assassinate Zia, uh, that uh, just about everybody was potentially guilty. Um, and if you look at, at Pakistan's levels or, or its dimensions of insecurity, um, I mean, when it comes to Afghanistan, there's at least three uh, that I would put on the table. One, of course, is, is it's fundamentally its relationship with India. If, if Afghanistan and every Afghan you speak to will say Pakistan is their reason for, uh, for all their troubles. Um, uh, and if you pretty much say that to any Pakistani, they will always relate their existential issues to, to India. And of course, this finds itself in, in various forms, uh, uh, notably in terms of the conflict in Kashmir. So, so if, if, if Afghan's security goes through Islamabad, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Pakistan security really runs through New Delhi in this regard. And of course, the Indians are not beyond uh, seeking their own advantages and have, have sought their own advantages in Afghanistan, particularly over the last 20 years. And before that, in their funding and aiding uh, the Northern Alliance. So I don't think <clears throat> that dimension of the conflict is going to go away. Uh, one critical dimension of the conflict will go away with the U.S. removal, which is the U.S. removal, uh, which in some respects uh, points to, to an argument to be made, which is a, an American-led intervention on the side of the government of Afghanistan is ultimately a bad thing because if they were to remain there, it gives the Taliban a reason uh, for its legitimacy uh, and for the legitimacy of armed action. And, and without the American presence, without the NATO presence, there would be much less in the way of legitimacy. I think the, the second aspect, of course, to the Pakistan insecurity, uh, or second dimension, is, is the nature of the border itself. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I was filming this documentary down in Jalalabad and then uh, 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 at Torkham, the gate um, uh, with, uh, uh, at the foot of the Khyber Pass into Pakistan. Uh, and, and I was reminded that when we're in Jalalabad, that the, we filmed at the, the palace uh, of one of the kings who had negotiated the border within in, in Imperial India. Um, and, and the Durand line, as it's known, is still today and hasn't been recognized by any Afghan leader since the 1940s. And it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a, a source of tremendous insecurity. So a very simple method, of course, of ensuring that this does not become an issue is to, in a sense, metaphorically push the border forward by controlling the forces that enable you to do that, which has long been Pakistan's strategy uh, uh, and of course, saw took saw very much its its climax during the Taliban period of rule. Um, uh, so the Afghans themselves are part of the the reason for Afghan uh, of Pakistan's uh, own fears about uh, um, about Afghanistan and about what levels of insecurity it poses towards towards Pakistan. And of course, the third dimension of its insecurity is is the nature of Pakistan itself, with 40% roughly of, of, um, of Afghans being Pashto and roughly 20 to 25% of, of Pakistanis being Pashto. Uh, there's obviously a, a nationalistic element to this. Uh, and there is a, is a, there's a fear of, of the absence of control over these, over these warring elements. Uh, and, and the ISI seeks control by essentially uh, um, pushing the struggle over the border uh, against, uh, against Kabul. Um, and, and of course, within all of this is, a, is, a, is another level of insecurity. I mean, the Pakistan military has for a long time been seen as a state within a state, uh, um, very well catered for, prote protected, buffered, privileged. Um, but ISI has been seen 
as a state within the state within the state. Uh, and of course, ISI famously was the, the, the agency that took control of the Mujahideen, elements of the Mujahideen back in the 1980s. Um, and uh, it, it was the, the agency that really fermented uh, the Taliban as a response to the chronic and anarchic levels of insecurity that followed the, the, the withdrawal of the Soviets in 1989. And, I, and I'll just make the point here, there's a great moment in the movie Charlie Wilson's Warn, for those of you who haven't read the book or seen the movie, Charlie Wilson was a rather uh, obscure American congressman who uh, came to fame partly by his uh, party habits uh, um, but, uh, uh, but also because he was the man who motivated for an enormous increase in, uh, in funding to the Mujahideen uh, in the 1980s, uh, which was, of course, matched by the Saudis in a complex version of history fund with, with arms coming from, from, uh, from Israel and all sorts of things and Egypt. Um, but the, 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 there's a moment at the end of the movie where Philip Seymour Hoffman and uh, Tom Hanks playing Gus Afrikatis, the CIA agent responsible for Afghanistan, and Hanks as, the, as Charlie Wilson. They're talking at a celebratory dinner at his, at his uh, flat in Washington. Uh, and essentially, Gus, Gus Afrikatis says, don't celebrate. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing the event, but, you know, the ball keeps bouncing. You've started something going, and the ball keeps bouncing. And later, when Wilson is at a congressional hearing, he said, this is what we always do. We go in, we pretend to save people, and then we leave, we always leave. And what the United States did in the 1980s as part of the Cold War logic of the time was to support the Mujahideen uh, with the participation of, of Pakistan, who didn't want the Soviets camping on the borders either. Um, uh, and they had nearly 4 million Afghan refugees within Pakistan by that point. Uh, and when the Soviets left in the 1980s, the Americans essentially left, rather similar to today. But that ball did keep bouncing. And you saw the rise of, of, of the Mujahideen again as de disparate uh, uh, forces of governance, if you could term them that, across the country, not united anymore against a common enemy, but fighting among themselves, which John has described some of the major leaders, Dostum among them, Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was the famous Northern Alliance leader who was killed just before 9-11 by Al-Qaeda. Um, these are just some of them. Uh, and I think if you look at Afghanistan today, uh, post the Western withdrawal, uh, it's slightly different because they have promised to continue to fund, but post the Western withdrawal, is, I mean, I think there's three possible scenarios. One is that the Taliban take over. And I think then we have seen already, there's been a great deal of hope expressed in some rather uh, um, uh, surreal articles written about a moderate, a more liberal, liberal Taliban emerging. I think they've drunk the Kool-Aid, uh, frankly. Um, but if you've seen from what the Taliban has done in the areas that they've taken over that, um, moderate Taliban seems to be a long way away. Um, so there's the first scenario of the Taliban taking over. And I think we can do then is pray very hard for the, for the, uh, for, for the Afghan people and particularly for the women within Afghanistan who face a particularly traumatic time ahead. And then of course, that'll lead to all sorts of regional conflagrations now that the common enemy has disappeared and in, 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 the, in, the, in the modern Soviet sense, the, the United States, uh, these, disparate elements will soon turn against each other because they all have interests. And I don't believe that Russia, or for that matter, Iran, wants to see a resurgent uh, Taliban, strong Sunni Taliban, uh, in the case of Iran, uh, on their borders either, or on the borders of their near neighbors in the case of Russia. So the second scenario, which is essentially that you get what I described earlier, which is a, a, a sort of standstill situation, that the government is able to hold these provincial capitals and the peace process can take over, um, that is the much more hopeful one. And that has a certain path. Of course, it's very difficult. And the one thing I didn't say, Michael, is, you know, there's 38 million people roughly in Afghanistan. Uh, 
Um, they're pretty now much more modern than they were 20 years ago, connected and everything else. But that doesn't mean they have a particularly strong level of commitment to, to, uh, to political uh, uh, organizations. And you see this, I think, in particular in terms of, of uh, voting patterns. So of the 10 million Afghans who registered or eligible to vote, just 1.6 million voted in the last election in 2019. So very low levels of representation. John described the president as the mayor of Kabul. It's not a geographic sense. It's really about, it's about the level of extension of governance across the country, a very difficult country to govern. And I, I'll just give you an anecdote finally here, uh, if I can, when I was in Camp Bastion and Helmand and, and looking, sifting through um, uh, transcripts of interviews of Taliban commanders, trying to understand the core reasons for continuing fighting. Um, and uh, we were asking these Taliban commanders, what do you think about uh, um, the Brits? What do you think about uh, Americans, the Italians, et cetera, et cetera. And when asked, one of them asked, when he said, what do you think about the Brits? He said, ah, he said, they're a tribe from the North. They come here every hundred years or so, and they then leave again. And for people living in these very contained, isolated areas, their view of the world is that, that small isolated area and that's echoed by the writings of people like, like Rory Stewart. And then finally, finally, I mean, the third scenario is the really sort of 1990s redux, which is the country resorts to civil war, uh, that, you, that you see these pockets of resistance that John has described, Ishmael Khan, Dostum in the North, uh, Shah Massoud's legacy in the Northern Alliance, uh, in the Panchia Valley and elsewhere, uh, people continuing to fight and perhaps around Kabul as well, um, uh, strongly fortified as it were against outside elements. And that is again, a very desperate scenario. So I think what, what the international community and particularly the United States, and I completely agree with what John says about Biden. I think he's done it, done it he's a breath of fresh air in, in foreign policy terms in Africa, at least in terms of where, where I've encountered American thinking. But in but in um, Afghanistan, this is a uh, this is a responsibility which he's turned uh, the other cheek to. Yeah, thanks, Greg, um, John, uh, and you can segue into the comments or comments into the broader regional question of alliances that uh, I posed as well. Yes, all right, I, I, I'll be brief. I, I mean, it's essentially. Just as, as Greg says, for Pakistan, Pakistan's mortal enemy is, is Iran, is, sorry, is India. And so their fear is that if you have an, an India aligned Afghanistan, uh, then they are surrounded on both sides. That's their big fear. And then the other point I would, Greg, Greg referred to, which I'll just highlight, is that there are parts of the Pakistan border region that Pakistan doesn't control very well itself. And so that's an added reason for their anxieties. Um, uh, the uh, uh, what else is essential um, in terms of the other countries? I mean, you know that China, while America was was uh, uh, spending money on military, uh, um, uh, wasting assets in Afghanistan, China was investing in mines, some of which were being guarded by Americans. So the Chinese are, are looking ahead to mining interests there. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's hard to say how they'll all coalesce. They, they all have interests. I think they would all like peace, but they have, but they have interests. So I'm not sure how any of that's going to come, come, come to, to light. Um, yeah, let, let's, let's see if there are any more questions. The one really interesting question, which I do want to get in, uh, we can go for another 10, 15 minutes or so, but, um, and, and you refer to this, John, is what lessons we can learn from the West, NATO and Afghanistan for the potential war up in northern Mozambique. I think that's worth uh, fleshing out a little bit, although that's not naturally our prime focus this evening. It is highly relevant and not sufficiently discussed, as you said, um, here. So I want to pose that for both of you. Uh, who do you want and to first? You go first, John. Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, the first thing is um, my, my, my general comment about Americans' wars uh, 
is when you go in with the intention of overthrowing a government, you are taking on the most serious responsibility. And you have to better have a, a pretty serious idea of what you want to do afterwards. And, and of course, uh, that, that didn't happen in Afghanistan and in too many places. It didn't happen in Iraq and in too many places it didn't happen. Uh, as to Mozambique, I mean, my fear is that our military, Greg has written about this extensively, and I have too. Our military is not in good shape. Uh, uh, my fear is we'll blunder into this because we want to go in, the Rwandans are going in, others are going in. Mozambique is a serious problem in the Cabo Delgado area. Uh, but will we have a clear, effective plan, know how, know how to go in, what we intend to achieve, and most important, have an exit strategy? And that's my big worry. I don't, you know, because, because the underlying issue, of course, there is socioeconomic. So uh, as, as Greg has said about uh, Afghanistan, this is, can't be seen as a purely military exercise. We've got to have a plan to, to see how you're going to um, give people some, some sort, sort of survival mechanism so they're not obliged to turn to IS or whatever it's called there just because it's the only place to get any bread. Do you want me to go, Mike? Yep, Greg. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a, it's a great and obviously very topical question, and I echo John's comments about the state of the SANDF, on which we have uh, spent enormous amounts of money on, on, uh, on a force uh, and forgotten the core element, it seems, that is necessary, uh, and uh, which is to have uh, people who are fighting fit. Um, and really, we, we can turn out perhaps 7,500 people at any time if we don't rely very heavily on reserves. Um, uh, and we have all this kit that we can't use uh, uh, and no operational expenditure for it. So the military is obviously keen to, to, to become involved in these conflicts, but I would would, uh, would not just for reasons of military uh, readiness uh, uh, urge some caution. I think what Afghanistan teaches us is, is the absolute imperative of understanding and dealing with your enemy. Uh, and as I said right at the very beginning, you know, war represents a failure of politics. And so to, to deal with any insurgency, you, you can't try and crush it but you need to understand your foes, why they're fighting, and devise a political solution. And as we spoke about, both of us, the failure, the big failure in Afghanistan was not doing this with the Taliban in 2002. And, and, and I, I wrote an article in the New York Times in 2006 as I was leaving the headquarters, which made me deeply unpopular uh, and had huge fights with, with the commander as a consequence of this and saying that um, there was, a, was time to talk to the Taliban. Uh, and there was a feeling amongst the military that the imperative of, of continuing the fight because you wanted to drive the Taliban to the negotiating table. And I'm of the view that the more, uh, I was of the view then, I'm still of the view today, that the more Afghans you killed in the process, the more recruits you created for their cause. So, you know, the, the objective is not a battlefield victory, but a better peace. Uh, and I think that you have to ask yourself, as we see the involvement of, of the Rwandans and the Rwandans being uh, uh, essentially a catalyst for South African or Southern African involvement, um, because the Rwandans are ostensibly operating as a mercenary force, uh, doing the bidding of Total and others in this process, um, we, we essentially losing sight of why these forces are fighting. Is this an Islamist agenda? Is this a secessionist agenda? Is this because the North is comparatively so poor and neglected in Mozambique? Why are people fighting? The second big lesson is you need to send, set realistic goals. I mean, I think the West, West strategy in Afghanistan was flawed from and unachievable from the start in this regard. Uh, the sort of carbon copy attempts to add a bit of democracy and and Western-style military operations clearly was never going to work there, and they were doomed to fail. It just took 20 years uh, for that to happen. Um, the process of transformation in Afghanistan wasn't doomed to fail, uh, but it was the key objective right at the very outset. I would argue that the process of transformation in Afghanistan is 
has not failed, is incomplete, uh, but that the military uh, operation has not really uh, um, accelerated that process. There was a question also, if I could just segue here to it, about how Afghanistan has changed. And Afghanistan has changed massively. Uh, and I'm sure John will testify to this too. It is, it is, you know, it's a country where, you know, there was very little in the way of, there was no central governance. Uh, it was ruled by fear. It was ruled by extortion, extraction, uh, rent seeking personified as it were in very physical forms of rent seeking. And some of that continues of course today, but um, the big change has been in educational terms and in, and, and, and in terms of the empowerment of the individual by particularly the cell phone. 30 million SIM cards have made a very big difference in Afghanistan. Uh, and that, of course, has helped to transform that society. And it's going to be quite hard for the Taliban, if they were to take over, to actually think they can rule those people in the same way as before. But going back to the, the lessons for, for Mozambique, I, I think also the Mozambicans have to realize that external assistance is only ever going to be temporary. And perhaps the Afghans fooled themselves in this context that they believed that they were going to be around for a long period of time uh, and they were going to have the support. And they always maybe thought that the international community was kind of play acting when they threatened to go. But it, 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 it is definitely a, a, um, a fleeting moment in the longer uh, um, run of history. And I think finally, I would say that, you know, uh, just two final things. I, I do believe that peacemaking has to be a regional undertaking. It can't be centered on external powers coming in, whether it's the French in Mali or the United States in Niger uh, or somebody else uh, in some other part of Africa or in the Middle East. It's really about the regional actors finding a solution that sees this in a, a more inclusive kind of win-win uh, concept rather than the zero-sum concept that Afghanistan has traditionally been and has increasingly become over the last 20 years. And then I think obviously the last lesson is uh, out of Afghanistan for Mozambique is, is you control your own fate. Um, um, and of course, blame is shared for the failures that we're seeing. Um, the West bears a huge responsibility in this regard. Afghanistan has its own share of the responsibility uh, but but eventually Afghanistan controls its own fate. And so it has to, to work towards that end. The local ownership of the problems is absolutely crucial. And I think if you look at Mozambique, you'd have to say that as a liberation movement, uh, although it had a very poor inheritance, uh, Frelima has done an extraordinarily poor job in extending governance across the whole country. It's been very good at extending governance sort of south of Gaza and enriching a very small elite, uh, um, but not very good at extending governance countrywide and spreading the love a little bit and growing the pie. And, and I think the, 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 the danger in a military operation in Cabo Delgado is this is seen as the solution. It may just be <clears throat> of a solution at very best, but it may also just end up simply uh, um, uh, distorting uh, the real reason for people fighting and just simply postpone the conflict oh. today. Thanks, Greg. Um, well, I'm very pleased that you picked up the question about how much Afghanistan has changed. Uh, and that's really, I think, the note on which I'd ask John to end his commentary on Afghanistan between the past and the future, different from the sort of tribal and faction-ridden uh, past, but not yet <clears throat> in a sort of modern nation state. Uh, maybe you would like to comment on that as well as some of the other uh, elements that Greg's commented on. And then I'm afraid we'll have to draw to close. <clears throat> We've got loads of other questions, but we do have a limited time. So John, do you want to wrap up for us? Y yes, thanks, uh, Mike. Um, yeah. Uh... Uh, you, well, you know, I lived on Flower Street in, in, a, in Kabul, which in the 1970s was a, was a modern street with, with shop, shoppers in short skirts. Um, so things went backwards in the Taliban era. Since the Taliban, the last 20 years, Greg is absolutely right. 
The advances have been enormous. There, there were no newspaper, there were no uh, TV stations. There were, you know, the very, very limited media. There was absolute massive increase in media. Uh, vast numbers of people got educated. It's a completely different society. What does that mean for the future? It really depends. I mean, if the Taliban takes over towns, there's a very good chance that they'll be almost as bad as they were before. Um, that, you know, that they, you know, you know um, uh, um, TV was banned. Uh, ra the radio wasn't allowed to broadcast soccer matches and newspapers weren't allowed to show pictures of human beings. I mean, it was that bad. Um, <coughs> so, so we really don't know how bad it's going to end up. I did want to just respond. I see someone asked the question about AFPAC whether that was a good idea. It was coined, coined by Obama when he was running for president the first time, that you really had to see Afghanistan as, as tied in with Pakistan. And I was very heartened when I saw that at the time, because it meant he'd understood that Afghanistan's um, uh, security couldn't be divorced from Pakistan. However, I was rather disabused of my, my uh, good views when I had dinner with Richard Holbrook and General Eikenbury. Uh, um, in 2010, because uh, Holtbrook was put in charge of the AFPAC project. And I was, well, I don't uh, suppose I have time to really explain or wh wh why it was happened, but I, I found that what they were trying to do was far too short term and limited. What Holtbrook was trying to do was, was trying to do kind of quick political fixes in, in Kabul, which alienated people immensely. And uh, uh, the real idea of, of, of seeing this as a major strategy uh, just was never was never taken seriously enough. And there was conflict between Holbrook and the Obama people and so on. It was never really resolved. Um, and then the final point, perhaps, is you know, I think Andre Schneider has also asked whether, what the differences between the withdrawal from Afghanistan and Vietnam are. I think the jury's still out on that. Uh, I mean, if it's possible that there's a standstill, as Greg hopes there will be, and Taliban and, and the Afghan government are forced into some kind of uh, way of working together, that could be um, a, a, a very encouraging. But right now, there isn't a so real sign of it that I can see. I can see that the Taliban is fighting every step they can and, take, and, and, and being pretty ruthless. So I, I don't rule out that it could be very bad. Well, on that note, I think we, we uh, should, should draw to a conclusion and no doubt we will be readdressing this issue because this, as everybody says, is uh, not over by any means. And there's the long run of history as well as pressing current events. Um, it's been fascinating, both our panelists, I think we owe our thanks to for their fluent and insightful comments. And for the many questions, and my apologies to those who did not get their questions answered, but there simply wasn't time. So uh, I'm sure you will all join me in thanking Greg and John and saying we may well come back to you guys in a couple of years to uh, give us an update. So once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Very good session indeed. Uh, so good, good night from us, and thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.